open up the gates. just bow our heads together and give God praise. Lord, we lift your name up today. We're here to hear from you, Jesus. We're here to give you our praise, our prayers, to lift up our hearts to you. Thank you, Lord, that you know and you love each one of us, that you lift our hearts when we're brokenhearted. You hold us together. Lord, we trust you that our future is in your hands. We trust that this morning you have something to say to us. So, Lord, help by the power of your Holy Spirit to open our hearts. If our hearts are hard today, Lord, I pray that you soften us and that you have your way with us, Jesus, because we are yours. We praise you. Amen.
forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am Sing it out
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Let me hear you sing it. There's no shadow. truth, Jesus. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. after us, Lord.
receiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. And I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is to see you later gotta hit the road gotta hit the road the sun and change in the atmosphere architecture unfamiliar i could get used to this time flies by in the yellow and green stick around and you'll see what i mean there's a mountain top that I'm dreaming of If you need me, you know where I'll be I'll be riding shotgun Underneath the hot sun Feeling like a someone I'll be riding shotgun Underneath the hot sun Feeling like a someone 
South of the equator navigator Gotta hit the road, gotta hit the road A deep sea diving round the clock Bikini bottoms, lager tops I could get used to this Time flies by in the yellow and green Stick around and you'll see what I mean There's a mountain top that I'm dreaming of If you need me, you know where I'll be Alright, so I want you to do right now Turn to your neighbor and ask them if they brought any eggs Now don't condemn them if they say no Say, have you brought your Easter eggs in yet? Okay, good so now, those of you who feel, uh, well, I just said ask them if they brought their eggs in. I didn't say ask for their name or address or phone number. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't want to disappoint 2,000 children who are coming next Saturday morning at 11 a.m. and they're expecting 30,000 candy-filled eggs. Now, I just want to say, on behalf of those who are faithful to this point or those who remembered, right, uh, we're over 20,000 eggs so far. So we're, we're two-thirds of the way there. Yeah, we ought to praise the Lord. I find it interesting, our church always seems to grow in attendance as we near the Easter egg hunt, but mostly it's those from the dental community. It's mostly doctors and dentists who are excited about what we're doing to ruin our children's teeth. But, uh, so bring your eggs in, you can bring them in any time during this week. If we're not uh, here for some reason, just leave them by the doorway outside. Um, and uh, you can bring them Wednesday night, you can bring them up until Good Friday service. So if you can even do that if you plan to be with us. So speaking of that, Good Friday is this Friday coming up. I mean, that's amazing when you stop and think five days from now, noon, we'll gather in here. Uh, we're going to worship together. There'll be a short uh, message, and we're going to take communion together on Good Friday. And then the Easter egg hunt, you got to be there at 11 a.m. sharp. We start right on time. There's children are tyrants, and if I don't begin on time, they'll overrun me, okay? So we start on time. If you get there at 11.05, you've missed it, okay? And then um, Easter Sunday. So three services on Easter, they're identical, 7, 9, and 11. And uh, there's child care for all three of them. Um, but here's the thing. Um, I don't know if you guys heard about it, but, but last Sunday at our 11 a.m. service, we had people standing in the back during the service on the main floor and in the balcony. It was absolutely packed. And that's not an Easter Sunday. Look around today. Our church is very full at the 9 a.m. service, okay? So, so you imagine next Sunday when you invite friends and family, how full church will be. I'm going to say to you that the 9 a.m. service, the one you're setting in now, next Sunday will be the busiest. It'll be the fullest. If you plan to be with us, you better be 20 minutes early. If you remember Christmas Eve at our 4 p.m. service on Christmas Eve, at 10 minutes to the hour, this room was full. We could not put anybody else into it. And both overflow rooms were full. We couldn't put any more people into it. And there were people standing in the lobby 10 minutes to the top of the hour. So if you're inviting friends, you're inviting family, have them come to the fight. Have them come at 10 to 15 minutes before, fight to get a seat. But we want to make room. So I'm going to suggest to you 9 a.m.ers, okay, because you guys are rugged. You guys are go-getters. You're, you're not lazy like the other people we know. Um, I would come to the 7 a.m. It's the same service. It's the same thing. And, and, uh, and be early risers and make room for our guests who are coming next Sunday. So we're excited about that. Are you excited about Easter weekend coming? I believe it's the greatest weekend we have, yes. So let's pray, ask God to bless uh, the word and next weekend, and then we'll jump into it. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're a good God, you're a faithful God, you complete things. God, for anything that is incomplete in us, anything that is missing in us, I'm so glad that the work you did on the cross and your resurrection was redemptive work. You were paying the debt that we owed that we, we could never pay back. It was redemptive, and you are still doing redemptive work today. You are still providing for us everything we need. God, would you redeem the days we've lost? Would you redeem the, the, the moments we've lost? Would you redeem the brokenness of our heart? God, our failures and our flaws. Would you do your redemptive work today? May you be glorified. May you be honored this weekend to come. Good Friday and the Easter egg hunt and Easter Sunday. May you be high and lifted up and resurrected. You are our resurrected Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. And I pray now for the word of God as we share it, that your anointing would be on it, and that the Holy Spirit would be the teacher of the hour. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's give praise to God one more time. He's a good God. So if you got your Bibles, I'm going to be in John, the 21st chapter. And uh, it's a familiar passage if you've been around church at all for a while. John 21 is the story uh, about Peter and the disciples. 
and Jesus is returning uh, after the resurrection. This is post-resurrection, okay, to set the, the groundwork. This is after Jesus has died on the cross, and this is after he has come back from the dead, and a few weeks has passed by. And John, John records an interesting story for you and I, and I just want to share it with you today, uh, just a few verses, and I, I'll probably continue it after Easter Sunday next weekend. Um, but, but I want to just open the door to it today. So if you got your Bibles, John 21, verse 1 says this, Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. If you're keeping count, this is the seventh appearance he's made after the resurrection. He's only got two or three more to go before he ascends into heaven. So he appears to his disciples. It is the third time that they have seen him. And the Bible says this, that, that John recording the story, he said it happened this way. He said Peter was there and Thomas, who is also known as Didymus, the twin, the doubter, right? Thomas is there on this occasion. Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee. James and John showed up, the sons of Zebedee. Look at the detail that John gives, right? And he said that there were two other disciples who we know to be Philip and Matthew. They were all together and, and, and Peter announced, I'm going out to fish, he told them. And the others said, we will go with you at well. So all seven are going out to fish. And the Bible says that they... They went out and they got into the boat. Now what is of interest to me today and I want to talk about for just a few moments is two things. One is the boat. The boat clearly is Peter's boat, right? I mean, he's not saying I'm going out to fish and I'm going to bum somebody else's boat. John doesn't say that. So we know the boat is Peter's, right? That's important for you and I to know today as we start the story. And then in verse 3, the opening line, it's what Peter says. He says, I'm going out to fish, he told them. This is what I want to look at today. And the reason why this is important to you and I is because you may not see it on the surface. You may not even understand what is happening. But what Peter is saying there, I'm going out to fish, tells me very clearly that Peter is in trouble. Peter has gotten himself into a pickle. Peter has made an epic mistake. As a matter of fact, Peter has failed to meet the demands that were asked of him. Peter had made a promise to Jesus not more than a, not more than a month earlier and said, Lord, if, if they're going to try to hurt you, I would die for you. I would take a knife for you, Jesus. Peter makes a declaration, I will stand with you, Jesus, even if they have to kill us both. But Peter didn't do that. Peter didn't uphold his end of the bargain. And so when I say Peter is in trouble, I'm letting you know that Peter is traumatized. Peter's devastated by the decision he's made and he is demoralized by his mistake. See, I entitled this message, Failure is Not Final, because I want you to understand something. There is the potential for you and I to believe that when we fail someone, that when we fail to meet someone's wishes or demands, when we fail to keep a promise, when we fail to complete a job, when we fail to keep the commitments of our vows to our spouse, when we, when we fail to do anything in life, you need to know it is not final. It is not final, and neither is your failure fatal. You need to understand more dreams have died because of fear than because of failure. Did you hear me? More dreams have died because of fear. The fear of attempting to do something, the fear of trying a new thing, the fear of taking a risk. More dreams have died because of fear than ever because of failure. If you have failed, I say you get back up and you do it again. If you have failed in a relationship, I say you dust yourself off, you rise and you do it again. Failure is not final for you and I, and you and I need to understand that today. Listen, your failure is the result of something you did. It is not the reflection of who you are. Did you hear me? Your, your failure is the result of something you did. You did something wrong. You made a mistake. It is the result of something you did. It is not the reflection of who you are. Your failure, what you failed at, does not mean that you are a failure. You know how I know you're not a failure? Because my Bible says my God doesn't make junk. My Bible says my God doesn't make mistakes. My Bible says that God doesn't make failures. He made you whole and complete and holy. You were created in his image. You are not a failure today, my friends, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Peter, by the way, is devastated. He has not heard this sermon that I'm preaching today. He needed to hear it. He needed to hear that yet failure is not final. You understand, right? Think about Peter's life. If you don't know the background, I'll give it to you real quick. Peter was there. You need to know that Peter was there. Three and a half years, Peter has followed Jesus Christ. For three and a half years, he's a disciple. For three and a half years, he's given up fishing. He's left his boats on the shore. He has never, by the way, you don't read anywhere in the Gospels where Peter fished during the three and a half years he followed Jesus Christ. While a disciple, we don't see anywhere where he went back to fishing. 
So, so you need to understand that Peter was there for Jesus. For three and a half years, he became a fisher of men. Matter of fact, it tells us that Peter was there the day that Bartimaeus got his sight. Peter was there when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. Peter was there when Lazarus stepped from the tomb. Peter was there when the lepers got their healing. And Peter was there when the blind man got his sight back. Peter was there for all of these events. He heard the teachings. He heard the messages. And he followed Jesus faithfully. He was there for all of those moments. And then in the last final hours of Jesus' life, Peter was not there. Peter was not there when, 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 when he believed the Lord needed him the most. Peter was not there when, when Jesus was tied to a post and whipped with a cat of nine tails. He was not there the day that they, they took a crown of thorns and shoved it down upon Jesus' head. Peter was not there for that. He'd already ran away from the Lord. Peter was not there when they nailed Jesus to the cross, stuck it in the ground on the cruel hill called Golgotha. And Peter was not there the moment Jesus died. And he was not there for the burial of Jesus Christ. The man he called his friend, the man that he followed faithfully for three and a half years, Peter was, was not there. Before you criticize Peter and before you begin to point fingers at him and say, Peter, how dare you? Be very careful that the number of fingers are more that point back at you and I for our own failures. Listen, if you're sitting here today and you happen to be that one person in the room who says, John, this is a beautiful message. I love where you're going with it. It's going to help a lot of people, but, but I've never made a mistake. I've, I've never had a failure in my life. Well, welcome to the club you just did by confessing that. We've all failed. We're all humans. We all, we all let people down. But you got to understand something. When I say that Peter is, is traumatized and, and, and he is in trouble, I know it because he says, I'm going out to fish. How do I know this? I know that he is trying to stabilize his life. Peter is about to fall. Peter is wrecked by the, by, by the thoughts of what happened. And, and you understand, right? Peter's done the math. Peter's looked at his life. Peter's looked at the fact that he ran away from Jesus in the moments when he needed Jesus or when he needed to stand up for Jesus the most. Peter has assumed that the reason why Jesus is dead is because it's his fault. That's, that's the only thing he can do, right? It's my fault that Jesus died. And, and by the way, Peter's right. And, and did you know something? It's all of our faults that Jesus died. If he had not died for us, we would not be ransomed free of our sins. Peter somehow forgot what Jesus said, that the Son of Man must be crucified and on the third day rise again from the dead. And by the way, it's been three weeks, okay? In the last three weeks, Peter has heard that Jesus is back. Peter's actually seen Jesus two times before this moment. He's actually ran into Jesus, but he's had no time to talk to Jesus. He's had no time to pull his friend aside and say, hey, dude, I am so sorry for what I did. By the way, dude is, is Greek for Jesus. Um, uh, he, he doesn't have any opportunity to do that, right? Peter is trying to stabilize his life. We will reach out and grab onto things that we believe are safe, secure, and stable. When you're about to fall, when you've been tripped, when you've failed, you'll, you'll reach out for just about anything for Peter, what he's reaching out for is the fact that he wants to go fishing. He hadn't fished in three and a half years. He, he wants to go back to his boat. Now, here's what's of interest to me, okay? I studied God's word, and, and what, what, what got my attention was that, that he still has a boat. He, he still has a boat. He was a professional fisherman, and when, when, when Jesus called him to be a fisher of men, he, he gave up his boat. How do I know this? Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. The first time Jesus ever meets Peter, Jesus says to Peter on the shores of Galilee, can I use your boat so I can teach the people? Peter said, that's fine, just make sure you clean it up when you're done. I added that last part on. Okay, anyway, so Jesus gets in. The Bible says Peter pushes his boat out. Jesus is on, on the boat, and he teaches the crowd on the shore. After it is done, Jesus comes ashore. Peter says, I'm blown away by what you just said. I want to follow you. And my Bible says in Luke chapter 5, verse 11, Luke records this. Jesus said to Peter, now you are a fisher of men. The Bible says in verse 11 of Luke 5, it says that Peter pulled his boat on shore, meaning that he put his boat on shore. I'm out of business. I don't need the boat anymore. And then Luke records this amazing line. He says, Peter left everything and followed Jesus. 
He left everything. I did some research. You know what the word everything means? Everything means nothing missing, nothing lacking. Everything means whole and complete. Now, I'm going to remind you that we know in our story that Peter still's got a boat. He may have gave up fishing for three and a half years, but he did not give up his boat. You know what the boat represents? The boat represents our plan B's. The boat represents our just in case. The, the, the boat represents to you and I an option, a clause in the contract. It, it's something I can go back to. And, I, and, and before we point fingers at Peter, a lot of you have committed your everything to someone. A lot of you have given your everything to your job. A lot of you are doing everything you can to raise your children. The truth is our everything is a lot like Peter's. Our everything uh, is really not everything. Because I think for a lot of us, we hang on to our plan Bs. We, we stuff them away in the sock drawer of our heart in the very back where nobody else can see them. And we hide those things and, and, and we hang on to them. I, you, you want me to help you understand what your plan, you want me to show you what your plan Bs are? If you're, if you're in the midst of a divorce today, I guarantee you, those of you who are struggling with your divorce, there's one in the group of that, of that relationship saying, I got a plan. I've got a boat. If this divorce ends and I become single, I'll be all right. I was happy when I was single. When I, when I was single, I didn't have to worry about whether or not I loved you enough or you loved me enough. I, there's your boat, right? You thought, I'll go back to being single. We often go back to the thing we know. Right? We often go back to what is safe, what is secure, and what is stable. And so in Peter's mind, he's going back to his boat, and he's going back to fishing. That's what you do when you think the marriage will end. You say, I'll be all right because I'm going to go back to being single. For the business owner today, right? You, you got a plan B. You got a boat nobody knows about. If the door is closed today, what do you think about business owner? I happen to be one too. One of our thoughts is simply this. I hope the door is closed. If the door is closed, I'm going to go back to being an employee. How awesome would it be, right? To work Monday through Friday, nine to five, no nights, no weekends, no payroll, no taxes, nobody asking me how to solve a problem. We think if we go back to being an employee, everything will be okay. Peter's going back to his boat. He's going back to fishing. He assumes this is going to fix it all. Somebody is sitting here today and your failure has caused you to believe that if I could just go back to when I was a child, if I could just go back to when I was a teenager, if I could get a do-over, right? If I could go back to that to that, that college experience, that's when I was at my best. If I, if I could go back to school, if I could go back to an old relationship, if I could go back to an addiction, we, we think the answer is in going back. And my friends, there is no blessing in going backwards. The blessing is in the present. God will sustain you. Remember, your failure is not final. So Peter says, I'm going out to fish. Now, what's interesting is what happens next. And, and, and we, if you, can you give me a little leeway for a moment on this? Because I see things a little different in Scripture, and, and you know that. And, and I'm not preaching heresy. I, I just see this story with a, with a little bit of a different twist to it. Peter wants to be all alone, right? When he says, I'm, that means me. I'm going out to fish. Peter probably wanted to be alone, right? Peter probably wanted to be all alone, on the Sea of Galilee in his boat. Why? Because on his boat, he was in control. On his boat, he made the decisions. When, when, when he was on his boat before, three and a half years earlier, when, when Peter was there before, uh, there was moments that only Peter experienced. He, there's nothing like a sunrise or a sunset on the Sea of Galilee. It was there on the, on the boat that Peter was most like himself. It was when Peter was most at peace when he was, when he was on his boat. Peter wants to go by himself. But the disciples all spoke up and said, we'll go with you. We'll go with you. And, and, and isn't it interesting that John gave us the list of who said, we'll go with you? It's just six men. And the list may not seem like much to you, but look at the list of men. It says in verse 2, it says that, that Peter's one of them. But, but Thomas is the first one that John lists. Thomas, also known as Didymus, the twin. Thomas is the doubter. Why would Thomas want to go on the boat? He doubts the boat will even float. He doubts they'll even catch any fish, right? I mean... Thomas wants to go. That, that was an interesting one. The next three make sense to me. When, when, when Peter says, I'm going out to fish, it's Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee. John wants you to let you know. He grew up on the Sea of Galilee. He knows how to fish. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they're fishermen. They were professional before they followed Jesus. But it's the last two. It's the, it's the two disciples at the end that got Peter's interest and gets mine. It's Philip and Matthew. Do you know what Philip and Matthew were before they were followers of Christ? 
They were tax collectors. They were tax collectors. They were, they were accountants. They would be very busy today, right, as accountants. Did you get your taxes done yet? I haven't. Pray for my soul. Anyways, um, some of you know my history with the Internal Revenue Service. We're not getting along in the past. So anyways, um, on the day, uh, they would have been busy, but not this day, right? It's, it's Matthew and Philip who say, we want to go with you too. The reason why that got my interest was when Matthew and Philip said they also wanted to go fishing. As tax collectors, my assumption is they have bought fish before. And my assumption is they've eaten fish before. But they are not fishermen, right? But when Peter hears they want to go with him, something triggers in Peter. And Peter thinks to himself, I finally got my wish. Do you know what his wish is? The wish of every man in this room. Peter gets the wish of every man in this room. At the core of who we are, what is the thing we want to be most in life? We want to be a coach, right? We want to be a coach. When a man is a coach, right? When he's a coach, he gets to teach newbies how to do something. As a coach, you teach him the do's and the don'ts and the yeses and the no's. When you're a coach, you teach somebody the rules of the game. So in this moment, Peter gets Matthew and Philip, two tax collectors who've never fished before. He says, boys, let's go fishing. They get in the boat that night, and you got to stay with me on the story They get in the boat that night, and Peter says to uh, Matthew and Philip, again, just my conjecture, stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Peter says to Matthew and Philip, boys, stay near me today. Don't go near James and John. They're fishermen too, but they teach you to do it the wrong way. This is my boat. I know how to run this boat. Stay with me, boys. They, They cast off from shore. The sun has set. They fish at night in this region. When the water is cool, the, the fish come into the shallows where it's warmer to feed. And, 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 and Peter knows this. He says to Philip and Matthew, he says, when we get out there, boys, when we get out near the, near the right spot, and by the way, don't tell my brother Andrew, I told you about this fishing spot. This is, this is my special one. I, you don't have to teach this old dog new tricks. It's been three and a half years, but I know every inch of this water. When we get out there, Philip, you hold on to this rope, and Matthew, you hold on to that rope. When we get to the spot and the anchor falls into the water, we'll let it settle for a moment. Hold your ropes tightly, boys. When the right time comes, I'll cast the net out about 10 or 15 feet. When it hits the water, it'll startle the fish. Don't worry. The net will slowly fall to the bottom of the water, and when it lands on the bottom, we'll wait for the right moment. When the right moment comes, I'm going to tell you boys to pull your ropes like you've never pulled before. Philip and Matthew, excited, thrilled, they keep looking at each other, looking at Peter. Is it time? Is it time? Peter says, when I count to three, you can drop the net and you pull the rope. So all of a sudden, Peter goes, he looks around. Remember, it's dark on the Sea of Galilee. He goes, one, two, three. And he casts the net and the net falls and it goes down to the bottom of the water. And, and, then, and then Matthew says, can we pull now? And Peter says, no. And then all of a sudden, Peter goes, pull boys and they begin to pull the ropes in as fast as possible. Peter probably says to him, listen, you're going to feel the weight of the fish in the net. It'll be like nothing you've ever felt before. When we get the net to the side, when you pull it over the rail, step back because fish will go everywhere. And as they got it to the side of the net, of the rail, and they pulled it over the side, the, the net was, the net was, um, the net was empty. They pulled the net over the side of the rail of the boat and it fell. And, and Matthew looked at Peter and said, what did we do wrong? And, and Peter said, you didn't do anything wrong. This happens from time to time. It's okay, we'll do this again. And we'll, we may, maybe this time we'll let it set a little longer. And they, they, threw the, they threw the net over again and again and again and again and again and again all night long. They cast the net out and they brought the net back. And John says, that night they caught nothing. Can you imagine that Peter, for three and a half years, hasn't fished? He's hung on to his plan B, his boat. It's what he goes back to in the midst of his failure and how traumatized he is. And now this night, as he's tried to show the others how to fish, the net comes back empty. Probably as empty as as Peter's heart was. See, what do you do, right? What do you do when what used to work before doesn't work now? Are you following me? What do you do when what used to work before 
doesn't work. Now, this is where Peter used to, used to find happiness. And it was on his boat, and, and, and then the nets are empty. Uh, this is where Peter used to find joy. I mean, but he's not happy right now. This is where Peter felt like himself, but he doesn't feel like himself. This is, this is where Peter had some of the, the greatest moments of his life, and the nets come back empty. What do you do when what used to work before, what used to give you joy, what used to give you happiness, what used to throw your soul doesn't do it for you anymore. The nets are empty. And the Bible says this, and I'll conclude in John 21, verse 4. It says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. This is an interesting verse for me because, because it tells us that, that Jesus was there early in the morning. And this is John's interpretation, right? I mean, I mean John, John, is, John is doing his best to interpret what is happening on this day because John is on the boat with Peter, okay? And he, he notices that it's Jesus early in the morning. But, but I want you to know something. My sense is that Jesus has been there all throughout the night. Okay? I mean, the reason why I sense that is, is, is Isaiah says that he shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. If God is with us, it's not just in the good times, it's in the bad times too. He's not the God of mountaintops. He's the God of valleys. He's not the God of, uh, of when it's working and the God of when it's not. He's always with us. I believe Jesus was there all throughout the night. In Peter's failure, in his darkest, most difficult moment, I, I believe the words of David come true. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Lord, you are with me. My Bible says that he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. I, I don't believe it was just early in the morning before sunrise when Jesus arrived. I believe Jesus saw when they cast off from shore. I believe he saw the first time they cast their nets and it came back empty. And the last time they came back empty. I believe Jesus was there for all of the frustrations and all the things Peter was trying to do to make this work. Do you find it interesting that John says that they did not realize that it was Jesus? I thought, well, that, that, that makes sense, right? I mean, this is sunrise, and it's quite possible as the sun broke over the eastern hills and the warmth of the rays went over the Sea of Galilee, which was a cold body of water, a mist or, 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 or a fog would have built on the water, and maybe it was the fog. It, it obscured their vision, and so when Jesus was standing on the shore, they couldn't quite make him out, but... But, but if that had happened, John would have said something about it. He didn't say anything about fog. And I thought, well, may, maybe it's quite possible that they were, a, they were a long ways off. They were in the middle of the lake, and, and at a long distance, Jesus would have just looked like an ant on the shore, and that's why they didn't realize it was him. But John clarifies later, they weren't that far from shore. I thought, okay, now I, I know now. I mean, this is after the resurrection of Jesus, and the reason why they didn't realize it was him was because he had changed form, right? I mean, it's quite possible after the resurrection, Jesus looked more angelic. He, he might have looked different, and that's why they didn't realize it was Jesus. But, but did I remind you this is not the first time they've seen Jesus after the resurrection? My Bible says that just two weeks earlier, they were in a room shut up, and Jesus appeared to him. Peter was in the room. John was there. Jesus entered a room, and he gave them peace. Thomas wasn't there, so another week goes by. Just a few days earlier, Jesus arrives again, and there's Thomas in the room with the other disciples. Peter is there. John is there. They saw Jesus. They saw as Thomas put his fingers into the holes in his hand and his side. I have to imagine that Peter stood in the back of the room, still embarrassed by his failure, still confused by the fact, why didn't I stand up for Jesus? Peter had to have thought to himself, if I would have known he was getting whipped that day, I would have rushed in and pushed the centurion to his side and took the beating myself. If I would have known they tried to put a crown of thorns on his head, I would have said, put it on my head. If Peter, if Peter would have knew that Jesus was really going to die, he would have said, stop hammering the nails. Peter stands in the back of the room, I am certain. Jesus and him have not talked about what happened Peter peers over the shoulder of James and through the angle of the arm of Bar Bartholomew and he sees Jesus and he goes, I know who you are. It's not that Jesus had changed shape or that he was angelic, that they didn't realize it was him. Do you know what it was? 
Do you know what it was? Do you know why they didn't realize it was Jesus? Because of the same thing that happens to you and I. Sometimes we can get so busy with our own thing, we miss the only thing that really matters. We can get so busy with our own thing, with our own drama and with our own issues and with our own problems and with our own mistakes and failures that we miss the, the only thing that really matters and that's that Jesus is standing here. Jesus is here this morning, my friends. I don't know what mistake you made. I don't know what your failure was. I don't know what kind of trouble you're in, but, but I want you to know that Jesus is here. And he is waiting for you to recognize him. It is in the moments that we recognize him. It's in those moments when we, we identify that Jesus has arrived. Do you understand one of the most beautiful things about the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that he came back for us. He came back. He came back for Peter, who was convinced that his failure was final, and Jesus was going to clear that up for him. So this morning, why don't you take the first step to clearing it up? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Just a quiet moment. We just, we're almost done. Maybe it's time you say to Jesus, I'm giving up my boat. I'm not going to have any more plan Bs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my everything. I will count on you, whether it's hell or high water, whether it's good or it's great. Maybe it's time you say to Jesus, I'm... I'm not going to go back any longer. I'm going to stay in the present. I'm going to face it because I know I don't face it alone. Maybe it's time for you to stop being so consumed with your own thing that you recognize and realize the only thing that really matters is Jesus. And he came back for you. You can just call out to him where you're at. Simply pray, ask him for the strength you need, the, the open door that you beg for. He's here.
shall pierce the night and I